Good morning, all. Um, my name is Theo, and I'll be leading us in our worship service this morning. This morning, our call to worship comes from Psalm 48, and it shows us how beautiful and great God is, how amazed even the most noble are by Him, and how we are to praise Him in our wonder. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion. In the far north, the city of the great king. Within its citadels, God has shown himself as a sure defense. Then the kings assembled. They came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in a panic. They took it to flight. Trembling took hold of them there. As the pains of a woman in labor. As w also as when an east wind shatters the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts. In the city of our God, which God establishes forever. Here in the call to worship, we ponder your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Your name, O God, is like praises that reaches the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go all around it, count its towers, consider well its ramparts, go through its citadels, that you may tell the next generation that God is God, our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide forever.
our first reading this morning is something of a confessional. So I'll read from 2 Corinthians from verse 2. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up in paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weakness. But if I am to boast, I'll not be fooled, for I'll be speaking the truth. But I will refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me. Even considering the exceptional character of the relations we have. Therefore, to keep me from being so elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for your power is made perfect in weakness. So I boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am truly strong. Let us pray. Lord, help us remember that it is your greatness that makes up for our weakness. Thank you that you are a God who is busy everywhere, even before we get there. Thank you for showing us that even greater you are than what we can imagine. Thank you for the furthest stars showing your greatness. Thank you for the tiniest protein within our bodies calling out your glory. Thank you for making us aware of our fault, Lord, that we can come before you and pray of our shortcomings. Yes, we know we're not perfect people. We do think of the negative. We do hide away from our jobs and responsibilities. Lord, we pray for those whom we have let down or who have let us down because of our shortcomings, Lord. Allow you to fill that void. Make us people that can acknowledge that we are weak, Lord, and that we are actually capable to do more when you are acting in our lives. God, help us find the places where we have the weaknesses so that we can see your glory. Allow us to use those spaces to serve others. And then we'll be given a chance to bring your love into the world this way. Thank you that you, we know that you provide for us. And that is why we can pray as you taught us. With our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Lord, open up our hearts this morning. May our eyes be open to your message. Allow us to see your glory and understand that you are in charge. You are at work. May we come to you this morning with open hearts and open minds and open ears to hear something new of your message. Amen. So it's during this time that we would normally share our good news. And this is a time when we recognize the fruition maybe of some of God's promises. It's a little bit tricky to do this online. So I would like to read a passage where God's promises have come to fruition in David's life from Samuel. So I read 2 Samuel 5 from verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time while Saul was king over us, it was you who led us out of Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, It is you who shall be the shepherd of my people, Israel. You who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Heron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned for 40 years at Hebron and reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all of Israel and Judah 33 years David occupied a stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around from the Milano inward. And David became greater and greater for the Lord God of hosts with, with him. And that is why it is important for us to realize that we are needed to draw nearer to God, just like David, so that we can get greater and greater. The scripture for today is Mark 6, verse 1 to 12. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets, not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on the few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at, the, at their unbelief. Then he went to about among the villagers teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the, the place. If you if any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Did you know that you probably have part of everyone that's sitting in the room right now, either in you or on you. We as humans have this fancy organ called skin that sheds. And the layer that protects you is actually dead. You shed enough skin in an hour to make up the same weight as a grain of rice. That not might be much considered the big space we're in. But thinking about all the mites and things that go with it, this makes up about 60% of all the dust in your home. 
the skin that has turned to dust floats in the air and lands in all sorts of places. It lands behind the TV and under your fridge. And when you scratch your head, you release even more of it. Some of it is even breathed in. So yes, there's a chance that you might have some of me in you. Or at least the other people around you. And sometimes we really try hard to see ourselves in the people around us. Sometimes we just like seeing ourselves in others. Or other times we're so focused on trying to find ourselves in others that that's all we focus on. But we need to remember we're all made differently for a reason. And we're all rubbing off on each other. And that's what this text is here to say to us today. It can be divided into two separate sections. And these two sections are vital for our message today. The first section we find Jesus being back home with his, with his people. But clearly his relatives are not really as comfortably at home with him as Jesus would expect. The people we would assume to be the most receptive of Jesus' words are probably the ones who reject him the second most. Those who were amazed at his teachings as a child are now astounded, not, as, as, not at his words or works, but that they can't recognize Jesus. He, is, he was one of them. He grew up in their neighborhood. He was with them. For this audience, this seems to be the greatest obstacle for them to receiving Jesus' teachings. It is the fact that they know who he was that stands in their way. In their astounded state, they ask questions of where, a, a what, and maybe a how, but never honestly asked who. For them, that question was settled. Jesus was one of them. Moreover, the way they spoke, is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, which is exceptionally derogatory in ancient Jewish traditions, because they exclude any reference to Joseph. And this might have been an, a direct insult to who Jesus was. It may be in reference to the illegitimacy of his conception in their eyes. It seems that here the ears of the townsfolk are more fixed on like gossip than the actual words of Jesus. It's almost like us being so fixated on the negative news in the, in the outlets that we have today on SCBC and so. That we only hear the bad news and not the good news. And, and honestly, most of the time we don't even know, especially with all the politics, if what is being said is true or not. These people in Nazareth would then rather stick to their own conclusions about who Jesus was rather than trust Jesus' own words. Their hesitancy to accept Jesus for who he was and ask where did he get these messages from and what is this wisdom given to him are both questions aimed at the source of Jesus' teachings. Because they know Jesus is getting his words from somewhere else, but they don't know where. But since they were so astonished at his teachings, it is safe to say that they know where he didn't get his teachings. He clearly didn't get it from his hometown, making it that there's no claim that these people can have to say, ah, there's Jesus. That's my boy. I taught him everything he knows. 
since Jesus didn't receive his teachings from them, they were not able to receive any of Jesus' teachings. It seems that they were not in a posture to receive. In fact, Mark lets us know that they took offense at him. It seems that their pride is offended. And is that not what keeps us from receiving Jesus as well sometimes? Do we not get offended when Jesus teaches us something that is different or a little bit out there? Who does Jesus, this person that I know, think he is? Does he think he's more important than me? Maybe we should think that we need to check who Jesus is before he opens his mouth and says stuff. After all, we all know what is really true. We all got the rundown of what is meant to happen at the meeting, before the meeting, in the prayer room, with the inner circle before the sermon started, right? Sometimes we need to break open that mold and find the out different things. After this, we should maybe look at the third question that they ask of how are such mighty works done by his hands? This question actually like challenges who Jesus was. And maybe for them, it has some reference back to the demonic powers that were spoken of in a little bit earlier in Mark. For that, we need to know that this text does fall in the section of the Bible after Jesus has done his sermon on the sea, where there were so many people gathered, he actually needed to get onto a boat to do his sermon. He then crossed the sea and healed people, crossed the sea again, and was told that he was driving out demons because of the mnemonic power, left and came back again, and now these accusations are piling on him. So yes, maybe it has something to do with that. Maybe they thought if we don't know how these mighty works are done, then our trust in it might remain questionable. We, we want to know how things happen instead of praising the majesty of the things that made it happen. These questions seem to claim that Jesus needs to prove or explain himself, even in his hometown. How questions... Give us a sense of control. They wanted to understand and maybe control a little bit of what Jesus was doing. They want to remain a judge over him, regardless of what he does. And ultimately, all three of these questions serve as rejection for who Jesus is as the word of God. And in this place, they can't receive anything he has to offer. As a result, their rejection of Jesus on his return trip home. Jesus only has then a few descriptive words to share with them. Because they're basically know-it-alls that can't receive because they don't know what they're missing out on. And Mark, saw, Mark also lets us know that he could do no mighty thing. <laughs> Just heal a few sick people. And that might be a clue for something that is hindering everyone else. Maybe it's only the sick people that were truly open to understanding some new direction. Because sickness has a way of making you more receptive to different possibilities. It is the healthy 
that need to rely on another more functional way of understanding. Sickness reduces normally our guard against others because we are no longer self-sufficient. So in the end, Jesus' lack of mighty work in his hometown is not just Jesus rejecting Nazareth. Rather, it is a consequence of the Nazareans rejecting Jesus. Their rejection is on account of their unbelief. Jesus was even amazed at their unbelief. It is how this space that we're in, where maybe even Jesus is feeling demotivated because of the distrust of others, where he turns to those whom he truly trusts to replicate him and instructs them to do so. And this brings us to our second section of the text, where Jesus is sending out the 12 to do everything that he has been doing, proclaiming to the gospel in need. And where they are not to go out and do so in their own power, but under his authority. And to do this and to allow them to, to be in his authority, he first gives them a status of reception. He makes them have to receive things. That is the posture that launches them into ministry. And it's also pretty similar to how it is with us. We can only give what we receive. Today we're reading Mark's gospel only because he was one of the 12 who received this message. And pass it on to others to receive it as well. This story certainly alludes to that future ministry in the early church. But notice how the posture of trusting and receiving is echoed in Jesus' charge to the disciples. They are to take nothing except a staff. They are to rely on providing their own, they are not to rely on providing their own <coughs> food or money or bags to carry things. This puts them in that posture of receiving. Every step of the way of this journey that they're going on, they have to receive everything. And interestingly, the one he does allow, the one thing he does allow them to take as a staff, maybe to serve as a reminder that every step of the way they have to lean on something other than their own strength. And that the Lord will be their staff. Also, the twelve are told to respond in much the same way as Jesus did in his hometown upon being rejected. Jesus told them that if any will not receive you, move on. And don't even take the weight of their dust with you. But rather... Shake the dust off. Don't let your own pride turn their rejection into a hindrance to not sharing the good news. Go and search for those that are in a posture of receiving to receive the message you have to give. Otherwise, you're just simply wasting your time. As a result of receiving Jesus' charge, they cast out many demons and anointed many with oil, many who are sick, were healed by them. I think Mark worked away many and twice on purpose, just to say how much work was done by them. Because there are many that the Father has made ready to receive the gospel. It is to those whom we must go, not the ones who are not yet ready to hear the gospel. As we go, we go as receivers of God's grace, trusting him all the way. If we are rejected, oh well, that's the one thing that we don't need to receive is their rejection. But in those places, we leave our dust. We're not to take their rejection, but rather 
Let their rejection fuel us and move us forward to the next who is willing to receive. Because we do not know how God is working in their lives. We are leaving behind the, a moment of ourselves that we do not know the impact of. We have done our part and God works where we are, just as the ones who come to ruffle the feathers and shake up the dust. We even might not even be aware of all the dust that we are leaving behind. Because even that small speck of dust, that small grain of rice, might get people talking and thinking again about who God is in their lives. We are here because God has made us aware of all that we are and that we're not enough. We might have rejected something of the good news or we might have been rejected for sharing the good news. And that's okay. As long as we're willing to go and check the dust in the corners of our minds and to walk with God into moving that dust into places where it will impact those around us. We get to move that dust and use it to create our own faith. Because we're not idle in the process. We need to go into the dark corners and kick up the dust of the impact that others have had in our lives instead of just taking it for granted. And God can use that to create faith in anybody's mind. And it is in those small changes where even the smallest speck of dust God can use to bring anybody to faith.
Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that sometimes we are the feather dusters to come and shake up the dust in other people's minds. Thank you that you have given us the opportunity to shake our own dust and cobwebs out of the way that are hindering us from believing more in you. Allow us not to get stuck on our old ways of thinking, Lord, but allow us to be refreshed by your mighty hand. Lord, thank you that we do not dwell so much on the identity of Jesus, but that we can dwell on the fact that his power is at work within us. We ask that this week you use us as conduits of this power, Lord, and allow our small impact on those around us to be a drive of change to bring about your glory here on earth. Use us this week, Lord, so that we can go out there and share something of your dust that is already in our lives. Amen. May the strength of God sustain us. And may the power of God preserve us. May the hand of God protect us. And may the way of God direct us. May the love of God go with us everywhere we go, forever and ever. Amen.